other than my parents, nobody thought we were gonna win that tournament. You know, nobody had faith in us, and, and it was just nice to prove everybody wrong. My name is Justin Fargo. My gamer tag is silly, and I'm a professional Call of Duty player. I grew up in Las Vegas, Nevada, you know, party city. I grew up with a really supportive family and kind of in the suburbs of Las Vegas, and uh, I've pretty much been playing Call of Duty through my entire life. I, I was definitely shy as a kid. Um, I didn't really come out of my shell until I was probably, you know, 18 or 19 years old. Originally, like, two of my best friends, um, we played video games since we were like, seven or eight years old, you know, we're playing like the old school consoles. You know, when the first Call of Duty's were coming out, we'd play all the time, and I kind of just never got off of the game, even though they did a little bit. And that kind of just continued throughout my whole life. Growing up, I've always been really good in school. I graduated fourth in my class out of high school, and I actually did go straight to college, but I decided to take some time off to play video games. So this is my full time now until I'm done playing. And I started playing my first Call of Duty like online, I was getting like really, really good over like a short period of time. I was like, wow, I really enjoy this. And I think my enjoyment for it really just escalated my skill and I actually got really good in a year period and ended up going pro my first year playing. So in Black Ops 1, playing all these S&D tournaments, there was obviously some money involved. I made, you know, ten, fifteen thousand dollars for that year and I was super excited about it. You know, I have no bills, no obligations, so I was pretty much bawling out. Um, that's when I that's when I knew that Call of Duty had a lot of benefits other than just being fun to play. When I started actually like making money, my parents were super excited about it obviously because you know I'm not even out of high school and I pretty much have like a little part time job here. So they thought it was a really cool idea. I bought, you know, a lot of my own stuff. I actually didn't use my first scuff controller until way after everybody else. My first scuff controller I got at the end of Advanced Warfare. Using a scuff controller definitely changes the game. I mean, I was pretty much playing at a disadvantage. The disadvantages of not having a scuff or playing with a default controller, especially in advanced movement cons, is that every time I have to jump or anything like that, I have to take my finger off of my thumbstick to hit my A button. And you know, so you can't jump and shoot at the same time. You have to choose, you have to decide which one you're gonna do. You, you absolutely have to have some kind of paddle or something in the back of your controller or else you will not be able to hang with anybody else. In Black Ops 3, going throughout the year, we placed top 12 again, top 12 again. And then for the second Pro League, we lost game seven again to qualify for the Pro League. So didn't make the Pro League again. So finally going into champs, qualify for champs, you know, I'm ready to go to champs. I feel like we can definitely do well because we've been this close all year, you know, so close just making it. And then 30 minutes for the roster lock, I got, re I got traded to another team and that team released me. So I didn't really have anybody to play with. 15 minutes for the roster lock, I joined a random team and just like put together players and we didn't qualify for champs. So for like a three month period there, I'm just sitting at home waiting for champs to happen, watch champs, nothing to play, nothing to do. And that, that year was just, that was my worst year of Call of Duty probably. But uh, I still try to stay motivated, you know, I still ended up playing in the next title and I kept it going. First event of Infinite Warfare, um, I was on e United. The e United team picked me up after they dropped like two players. It was me, Accuracy, Pac-Man, and Legal. After the first event, Las Vegas, my hometown, two of us did well, it was me and Accuracy. Me and Accuracy both played well, so we were both talking to our org because we both wanted to scrap the whole team. Uh, I ended up getting control of the roster, and instead of picking up pros like my org wanted me to, I decided to take a chance on three amateur players that had placed pretty decent at the first event. Uh, after picking up those three amateur players, Gunless, Prestini, and Arsides, we won the first event immediately after I picked them up. Prestini with another silly in a perfect position here. One more player it's alive. Done. It's done just like that. You see the disappointment on the faces of Optic. Winning CWL Atlanta was a surreal feeling. My first event win in my career, and I did it after having a terrible year last year. Um, it pretty much meant everything to me. It was my drive to keep playing, you know, it was, I was super proud of my teammates, of all these young kids I picked up and got me my first tournament win, you know, is the best feeling in the world. So during World War II, we definitely, I definitely feel like we lost our clutch factor. Going into the first two events, we lost game five, round 11 to TK. And then after that, with a mediocre pro league performance and a bad performance at Birmingham, I ended up getting dropped off of that team for a felony. And then I joined Evil Geniuses alongside Aix, Apathy, and Assault. 
I definitely don't think I was an issue on that team, but I was teaming with, you know, Call of Duty Legend Clayster, and I had two twin brothers on my team, so I'm just the odd man out. Um, I've been dropped before, and I feel like every time I do, I just come back with a fire. I started being the best player I've been, you know? I started destroying everybody, and I get picked up by evil geniuses. Right when I joined the team, we had an event a couple weeks after. We actually had, like, some next level SMB strategy. Our coach was a big part in all of our success during World War II. I feel like we invented most of the SMB strategies that people were using late in the year. People definitely caught up to our search and destroy. We went into the Pro League kind of cocky after Seattle. Like, oh, we don't need to change our strats, blah, blah, blah. Like, they're so good. Not thinking that people were gonna know exactly what we're doing. Like, once a certain smoke was thrown, people would set up you know, for that smoke because they knew what our strat was going to be. And we um, ended up not qualifying for season two playoffs because of that. We had an 0-16 S&D run after that, after Seattle. Didn't qualify for playoffs, so it gave us all the time in the world to prepare for champs. Prepared for champs, we pretty much scrapped every single one of our S&D strats, came up with all new smokes, all new nades, all new strategies, didn't show any of them online, didn't stream any of them, kept them all secret until the event, and ultimately ended up working, and we ended up winning the championship. Less than 1% of people had us winning champs. We were definitely underdogs. Especially with the way we had to stay in champs, we ended up losing a series in pools that we weren't supposed to lose. And the only way we can make it into bracket is if we 3 0 Optic. That's the only way we can make it into bracket or else we're eliminated out of the event and we 3 0 Optic. I think it's all over, man. Berlin, Hadrian's. Great walls that have fallen throughout history and now you can add the green wall to that pile. Ladies and gentlemen, Optic Gaming have been eliminated they were one map away from not even making it to bracket play, but the boots are back on the ground. Evil geniuses as an organization get that first world championship. I definitely think about the height of my career right now. Uh, I'm the most dedicated. I just feel like I need to continue winning.